Welcome to Mandemic Mondays, the only podcast hosted by best friends who have nothing in common except their names. I'm Mandy Kaplan. And I'm Mandy Fabian. We are the Mandys. And each week we will be reviewing, debating the latest Netflix release and whatever else people are doing to stay sane during these crazy times. Times we like to call the The Mandemic. Demic. You sound different, Mandy Fabian. Do I? Maybe it's because I'm standing in. (laughs) That was actually a very good impression of the multi-hyphenate Drew Barrymore in The Stand-In. Or do you think I should talk like this instead? Do you mind if I just call you Mandy as we host a podcast together the next few weeks? I would be honored. Because you're imagining it's me, not because of her. Well, I mean, she does have big shoes to fill and she's she's not gonna listen to this you don't have to kiss her ass (laughs) but i've heard she's hung so i i (laughs) i will try my best to honor mandy fabian whoa whoa put your shirt back on megan please this is megan parlin everyone not mandy yes she is our stand-in I am the stand-in. It's so meta. Um, But what's different about this is I feel like you and Mandy Fabian have such a clear diversion diversion in personalities, whereas you and I are a lot more similar. We are exactly the same in every way, shape, and form. And we We talk every day. We even look exactly alike. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's funny because you told me that Mandy said that when you told her I was going to be on this podcast, you said that we shouldn't talk. And I was Mm -hmm. like, wait, so we're not going to talk during the podcast? What what, what are people going to hear? I didn't realize you meant we shouldn't talk every day. I thought it was going to be a completely <laughs> silent podcast. <laughs> That's a whole different show <laughs> that I'm sure we can figure out a way to host. Um, so we watched the movie The Stand-In on Netflix. We did. Starring Drew Barrymore and Drew, Drew Barrymore. Barrymore. Mm-hmm. Right. Where do you stand uh, on Drew Barrymore, just so I can kind of get a, a barometer here? Long, rich history. Uh, the history starts with the fact that Mandy loved... Oh, here we go. And talking I promise about Mandy time, again. No, it's the last time. It's the last time. She's dead to both of us. Yeah. Uh, and after watching this movie, the mystery is like, did you actually kill her to get on the podcast? We don't She's know. She's somewhere in the woods. Yeah. I've heard. Uh, Mandy saw the movie with Hugh Grant, lyrics and music. And Drew Barrymore. And she was like, it's really good. She's so charming. And I was like, she's the most talentless person on screen. And we've been debating Drew Barrymore ever since. I accuse you know who of worshiping Drew Barrymore, which she says she doesn't. But yeah, uh, so I've I've always been anti and she's always been pro. Gotcha. Where do you stand on Drew Barrymore? I was thinking about I'm sort of indifferent on her. I feel like she's cute. You know, I love that she was in E.T. and I like her little smile that never goes away um but the yeah only with half of her mouth right coming out one side yeah yeah doesn't work so well when you're wearing prosthetics but um yeah i mean i was i was happy to see her back i guess but um kind of like all right what what you got drew barrymore and what does she got tell tell what the movie is about so the movie is about a um a disaffected comedic actress a physical comedian who um is very very famous and uh she has an ambitious stand-in who uh trades places with her um because the the disaffected actress has to go to rehab for self-medicating herself and um getting canceled in her career for a cantankerous outburst and she asks her stand-in to go to rehab in her place which then leads to the stand-in taking over her entire life very well done except a lot of big words i know if you could dumb it down for me i'd (sighs) I'd be grateful cantankerous disaffected it was (laughs) it was a lot coming at my face she's messed up thank you um yeah and drew barrymore had a prosthetic nose as the stand-in and a falsetto voice which you very beautifully imitated at the top of the show which i won't I'll just leave it to you. You did it perfectly. (laughs) What did you think of Drew Barrymore's performance in dual roles? This was her Medea's family. Yeah. This is her her nutty professor. (laughs) 
I think you know this about me that I was like a professional crank caller growing up. I, I mean, yes. that's really the only reason why I got invited to slumber parties is because of my crank call performances. And both of her voices reminded myself of me trying to pretend to be like a dude in high school or an older woman. And so I was so distracted by her voices. It was like, yeah, like, can you just... Can one of you talk normally or maybe an accent would have been better? Like Paula, the stand in is from the South. I don't know. The voices got to me so much and I just, they were so forced to me, both characters. And we're off to the races. I completely disagree. No, I was pleasantly surprised by her voice work in this movie. I wrote down voice work. Oh my Great God. Vocal distinction. And between you call two yourself characters. a voiceover artist. Eh, do I? <laughs> yeah. I guess because my expectations for her are so low. Sure. And had this been a different actress where I thought like, oh, what a talented actress. She's going to knock it out of the park. I might have felt like you felt. But this is Drew Barrymore. I expected her to be just god awful. And I actually didn't think she was. I thought she was. The vocal choices were great. And good I, prosthetic nose work, by the way. That's that, that's no credit to her. That's just a credit to whomever put that prosthetic nose on her every day. Did you feel like the prosthetic nose got slightly more flattering as that character came into her own more and more? It's possible, but I'm not shallow like you. Like, I cared about her soul more than her face. Oh, see, I, yeah. I found, like, the nose was getting more attractive and... And True Barrymore's main character, Candy's hair, was an indication of her mental state. Like, the frizziest it was, the most. It just, like, she was using her hair and her voice to give her motivation, basically. Look, I'm not going to say it's Oscar-worthy, but I was pleasantly surprised and pleased with Drew Barrymore's performance. See, what I came to realize when I was thinking about do I like Drew Barrymore is I think she's fine when she's, especially if she's in the company of really good talent or somebody very funny. And in this case, she's in her own company and she's right. playing off right. herself. So it was just, it just canceled out for me. Sure. I have to say, though, I'm coming off a very traumatic experience watching a movie called Thunder Force, which was a comedy that. with no laughs. And when, I pressed play on this movie. The first, the opening credit sequence was very funny. It was, well, also, did you catch that um, one post and it said Mandy's World? Yes. And I thought, okay, this is meant to be. It says Mandy's World. And for me, it went all downhill after that. It started me off right. It was like a really good amuse-bouche at a fancy restaurant. I was like, oh, okay, this put me in the good mood. And then it had a little bit of equity with me. Because the opening credits made me laugh coming off a movie where I didn't laugh for the first 26 minutes. Mm. So I was yeah. I was perhaps perhaps too forgiving. Well, you I, also did a movie 30 Nights of Sex to Save Your Marriage where you opened with a montage that included search engine type things, too. So you might have yes. a soft spot for that. I, I might. But I did it first for the record. <laughs> uh, Sam Bain, writer of Stand In. I did it first. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, I'm I, sensing already that I liked it more than you did, uh, but that that was a fun opening, and uh, I laughed. Then it turned out to not really be a comedy at all, <laughs> and I, that didn't hit me until like 30 minutes in when I was like, oh, oh, this is not really a comedy whatsoever. It's yeah, I mean, I know. I, I, I did not find the opening that funny, but um, it... And to me, as soon as the music, you know me, I, I always tune into the music, maybe to a fault, but I, that was an indication where I was like, this movie doesn't know what it wants to be because the music, it's just like pick a lane, you know, and, and it was directed by Jamie Babbitt. And I really like Jamie Babbitt. I, I, I am a big fan, but, um, her movies usually have like a clear world, a clear point of view. And I didn't find that in this one. You would say dark comedies, right? Her movies are dark. But they're dark, but with color and like poppiness. And I just found this movie just so drab visually and pacing wise. And I wasn't rooting for anybody. I can't say I was rooting for anybody, but I was engaged. Mm. I wanted to see how it was going to play out, which is not always the case. I'm very fidgety when I watch a movie and I have lots of other 
things happening and excuses to get up from the room. But I didn't with this one. I I stayed pretty focused. I guess, I mean, maybe it's too inside Hollywood, but having grown up in that world, it felt mean to me because, you know, I was on a TV show, as you called me out on, and um, I was around a lot of stand-ins and a lot of extras. And it's a hard, it's such a hard path because you're not paid well and you're watching these people succeed right in front of you and you're just like in the dark in the shadows and it just to me felt like a bunch of mean girls celebrities who probably had a stand in that creeped them out and then to make her so twisted um Mm -hmm. it just felt mean-spirited and i wasn't invested in anybody's journey i i hearkened it to all about eve which i'm a huge fan of so it was Mm -hmm. okay to me It didn't feel mean spirited, but I did. I'm curious being a person, as you just referenced that you were on a TV show growing up. I found the, the sequence with Holland Taylor, whom I love as the director and the way they filmed that I felt was like a very realistic portrayal of a film set. It felt real with the crew and the, and how they were all reacting off of each other. What did you think of that? Were you... Those were my favorite scenes. Those felt the most authentic, except when T.J. Miller busted into frame because I can't stand him. But... um Can anyone stand him at this point? I don't know. Yeah. Ugh. Yeah. Why? And and then I was realizing, oh, Jamie Babbitt directed Silicon Valley, so that mm. must be that connection. But um yes, those are my favorite parts because I'm too a big fan Um of holland what's her last name holland taylor holland taylor um so that resonated the most i agree now are you familiar with holland taylor from bosom buddies or are you too young and i hate you no i i i remember her from bosom buddies as okay well. yeah. how old do you think she was when she made bosom buddies uh the same age as she is now right she was mm-hmm. an older lady yeah always and very austere and in charge and had the standard rp she was yeah. 39 years old when she made bosom buddies wow is that i don't know if that's yeah i mean she looked ter- yeah i don't know if, to, if that means she looked terrible then or amazing now but she looks Both. the same yeah. she looks the same that's and when I, growing up i thought of her as like my nana's age Ruth. Right. Her name was Ruth on Bosom Buddies. Like I thought, such a Ruth, such a Ruth. I, like I was just like, oh, that old lady hmm. who runs the advertising agency. But she was yeah. thirty nine years old. Wow, isn't that weird? Huh. That is weird. Well, she was great. Um, yeah, I didn't mind those scenes as much. I, and T J. Miller, it's you know, here's a movie about uh, an actor who goes off the rails and. No, you know, Hollywood, will they give her this actress Candy Black? Will they give her a second chance? But T.J. Miller is getting a second chance. And yeah. he was a bad boy. And didn't he call in a bomb scare? That's what he did, right? As Something. a joke. Well, yeah. queen of prank calls. Where does that rank? How many bomb scares did you call in growing up? I never. Yeah, that's crossing the line. Right. I got close to that. And I don't know if he has other bad boy behavior, but. It has not seemed to have affected his workflow. I mean, I know he's not the voice of Mucinex anymore. That was his big oh, voiceover gig that he lost. Bust. And now it's Jason Mansukis, 601. Huh. But it's, it, you know, why does T.J. Miller get to be in movies? Right. I know. And he doesn't need to be. Yeah. I kind of felt like this movie could have been recast a thousand times. Like nobody needed to be in that movie. Well, it looked to me like Drew Barrymore produced it with her partner, Nancy. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. that's how they got all the cameos by all the fun Jimmy Fallon and, you know, and all of that. Lena Dunham. Yeah. Uh, but who would you have put in this part? Like if you wrote this movie, if you were the writer and and you, you were like, I'm going to get, oh, I'm going to get this person. Who, who would that be? I would want somebody a little more unexpected where it just didn't feel so close. I don't think Drew Barrymore is probably a cantankerous person, but just that she grew up in that world. Like I'd almost want somebody who we know is not that like a Kristen Bell or some, somebody who's just the antithesis of that, um, would, would just add another layer of removal from the darkness. And I wanted somebody more, more, who was more of a comedian. I thought Drew mm-hmm. Barrymore's acting was fine, but she's not a naturally funny physical comedian. So to, you know, any p- 
part of this movie that called on that skill. It, w- it was a bit of a letdown. And um, I immediately thought of Amy Schumer, who I, I think yeah. is actually a fine actress. Um, yeah. Or Kristen totally. Wiig or, you know, there are so many other people that I would have rather been in this. And in my mind, I was like, she, Drew Barrymore had to be like 35th or 40th on the list of gets for this, you know, director and writer. And and yet there she was. But I will say I, I was impressed with how au naturel she was as her as the, you know, candy character. She she didn't look her best, mm-hmm. but she that was really, you know, she was herself and she didn't like get super skinny for it. You know, she looked she looked real. It is nice to see a woman who is not size two yeah. carry a movie as a romantic lead. You know, I, I that yeah. I I did like that she wasn't they she wasn't glammed up. It would have been right. easy to have the stand and be a more glamorous version, but they were both different forms of unattractive for different reasons. So when I first read the synopsis of the movie, I thought, you know, great idea for a parent to hire, like, what a great business model, stand-ins for parents who find somebody to look just like them and and swoop in and live their life for a few hours a day. (laughs) Um, And I also, I guess I was thrown because I thought the rehab was going to be more of a story point. And it lasted like, Two minutes and thirty seconds, and, and she was out. Like Andrew Rannells, he was in the k- oh, yes, kitchen with yes. her, and we, I was like, oh, "Andrew Rannells is in this movie," and he had two lines, and he was done. It, yeah, it all just that all reeked of like, I'm going to call my friends and have them come do a cameo. But I thought the movie was going to be watching this poor stand-in at rehab. I, right. I thought that was going to be basically the whole movie, and then Me it was too. over. And, and that was just sort of a a starting point, an inciting incident, but I kind of wanted, I thought there was a missed opportunity there. Maybe Mm -hmm. they just cut it all out or something, but it was one of those movies where at the end, um, not to jump too far, but it ended really nicely. And I thought it was paced really nicely and shot. And like, I had this feel good feeling, which always makes me feel like an asshole when a movie ends really well. And I hated it. I'm like, Oh, Oh, you know, maybe I should have liked it. And, and it left me with that feeling where why couldn't the whole movie have felt like that? Mm -hmm. I wrote about bookends and that the the bookends are comedic and, and then the ending was heartfelt. And then the middle was all dark and twisted, which goes back to your point of like, what was the tone of this movie? Like, what, what was this? And it just wasn't quite dark and twisted enough to be dark and twisted. They just, they, they just didn't. They didn't push the boundaries in any direction for me. Right. I I loved it at at an hour in the stand-in, spoiler alert, the stand-in poisons the actress. And I thought, ooh, this just got good. She killed her. Now Mm -hmm. it'll get interesting. And then she didn't really kill her. And it was all just a disappointing, you know, a tease of something that could have actually been much more interesting and compelling. This is not an audio clip to play, but did you happen to notice it was 35 minutes in, uh, the candy character was getting ready, putting lipstick on, and did she dab lipstick in her nostrils? Did you catch that? (laughs) No. Can you, uh, when you have a chance, 35 minutes, 21 seconds, just tell me if you see what I see. I'll I'll make a note. I love when you give me homework. I just wondered if I, if that's a thing, like, is that a beauty thing I don't know about? Lipstick up the nose? I can't fathom. Um, it's, is it like that Carmex stuff and she's getting high? I can't. No, it was a. Cu- it was red and she in was her dolling nose? herself up. And then she went, and then, unless it was a weird angle, but I watched it twice. Whoa. Yeah. Leave it to you. I know. Um, uh, I do. I do have a clip that I would like to play because I am. Me too. As you know, I am averse to extreme profanity. And there is a sequence. At 11.37, play it, Pete. Why don't we talk about anything else? (laughs) Shit. Fuck. God damn it. Fuck. 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 That infamous incident from five years ago signaled the end of Candy Black's stellar career. And today, it was a string of profanity like I have never heard. And it was jarring it didn't bother me as much in this movie as in other movies because the whole movie wasn't like that 
So it was for effect in this one sequence. But um, yeah, it was a lot of bad words right in a row. Well, and that's because the to me, it was the J- Candy character was so just poorly done that she needed to lean on a lot of F-bombs to make herself seem, you know, disaffected. Edgy and a mess. Cool and profanity laced. Yeah. 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 My favorite moment, favorite being facetious at, at one hour, 20 minute, 51, one twenty fifty one, Pete. And I'm going to say it with them because I can do the voice. If you're, you're the, the real, real deal, deal, let's, let's have, have a woodwork, woodwork showdown. Down. Break out your chisel and we'll find out who makes the best nest of tables. I don't have to, have prove, to my prove my woodworking skills, skills to anyone. <laughs> this is such a bonus. Fabian never does the voices. That was incredible. I mean, let's have a woodwork showdown. Yeah, a woodwork showdown. <laughs> you know, I I don't watch a lot of movies because I have two young children and I don't do a lot of anything. Oh, you have kids? <laughs> no, my stand-in does. Yeah. Um. So I know that I I'm a little bit less, you know, used to the formulaic films for the common folk like you, but I just, yeah, it didn't do it for me. I understand that. I was entertained. And and we know I'm completely critical and I've hated a lot of movies that we've watched for this podcast. But this one, I, I, I was entertained. Um, and I'm looking through my notes. Richard Kind has a has a cameo. I adore him. Uh, so is he boing boing in Inside Out or Bing Bong or he's so he's just so charming. And I was so excited. It was a waste of some of those cameos. And someone like Andrew Rannells should be featured and hilarious. And instead, he just was like, just a face that you could, I guess, cram in the trailer and attract people to this movie. But yeah, it sounds like you're ready to give it manned jobs. And unless you have a better name for the rating system, I'm going to force you to give it a certain amount of manned jobs. Well, the great part about bringing me in is mega you can add to anything mega man jobs Ooh, but that so. would imply that two mega man jobs is better than two man jobs like does that well, include a reach around talk about the details of it it just means a really big cock oh it's the size not the okay it's not your effort it's the size of the yeah i mean drew barrymore this is a this is a star-studded film, so it doesn't change the weight of the man job. It's just the context in which it's being given. All right, lady. So I'm guessing not not a lot of megas. Oh wait, are we? I'm just saying we don't have we add mega to the word man job. Yeah, I'm giving it one mega man job. You are tough. You clearly did not watch Thunder Force or Concrete Cowboy. That's what I'm saying. Coming off of the, of that double whammy, I'm giving this three man jobs. Wow. Not mega man jobs. Just three good old fashioned, a little bit of Vaseline and a tissue man jobs. Um, well, you have, I have far less trauma in my man job past. It's true. So. Oh God, it's true. Yeah. I, but yeah, I was entertained. I was pleasantly entertained. I'm glad. Why, thank you. So you know that my mother-in-law is the manager of an independent bookstore, a lovely bookstore. Um, so I'm never for want of books. I can get whatever book I want, whenever I want. But she's kind of like a pharmacist in a way where she knows what you're getting and why. And so sometimes there's titles where maybe I don't want my mother-in-law knowing oh. that I'm reading a book about, you know... Dirty books. Dirty books, mental health books, you sure. know... How to deal with a mother-in-law, but you know right. she's, she's lovely. So I need I need another avenue, and so Audible has been great for that because I can just kind of pick some titles without my mother-in-law knowing. Very sneaky. The other thing is that no matter where I keep my books, my children find them. They lose my place. They color in them. They rip mm-hmm. them. My mm-hmm. husband and I cannot keep our books intact. It is so infuriating. 
So I have been using Audible a lot lately for both those reasons, for my own privacy and my own integrity. What are you listening to? Well, actually, (laughs) I've been listening to Eckhart Tolle's The New Mm -hmm. Earth. Mm -hmm. And I know it's a little... Oprah woo woo, but I've been really enjoying it. And it's like my own private thing. I think I, I think it's a good, wonderful thing to listen to. I listen to it, whether I am folding laundry or pretending like I'm listening to my kids tell me stories <laughs> or when I'm cooking, when I'm running. Yeah. Um, it's just great. And it keeps your place. You don't have a mm-hmm. grubby hands losing your bookmark. Yep. And you can keep the title. You know, even even if you're not a member, the titles are forever, which is For, amazing. Right. Well, because you get a free trial. I mean, you're preaching to the choir. I am an Audible fanatic. Casey legendarily bought four titles of food-related murder novels on my Kindle. And since then, I'm like, you know what? No kids allowed on Audible. I get to pick what I want, and he can't mess it up and order extra titles. And if other people want to listen to their secret shame books. I love that you pretend you're listening to Eckhart Tolle and not Fifty Shades of Grey. Um, (laughs) They can go to audibletrial.com slash pandemic and they can try it out for themselves. I didn't know that. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, you. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, anything you want to listen to without your mother-in-law or your children being involved, whether it's self-help or comedy or dirty novels or you know, nonfiction, fiction, it's all on audible.com. I know. And I didn't realize they had so many, so many titles and and they have original content. It's tons. It's really, yeah, there's a lot to mine for. Everyone go to audibletrial.com slash pandemic and check it out for yourselves. And don't tell Megan's mother-in-law. Please. What else you got? What are you doing to stay sane? I had to bring this one up because so I, I'm not to brag, but I work for a tech company. And one of the best parts about working for a tech company is we get free mental health. And so I get to have free therapy sessions. And actually, the reason why I have to bring this up is because my therapist's name is Mandy. Come on now. Not kidding. I remember um, all my life. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But this is not the part that's keeping me sane, the therapy, whatever. We, uh, she assigned me the, uh, the task of buying myself a stuffed animal because, you know, I'm taking care of everybody, but I need to take care of myself and I, I deserve the soft things and something to hug. So I went out and, um, I searched and I got one of those so soft stuffed animals that, you know, your kids get that they never play with and you don't understand why they want like the raggedy ones. Um, but I've been hiding it from my children. But <laughs> the funny thing is that um my husband, whose name is Dave, is kind of weirded out by it, you know, Um, and partly because when I was a kid, I used to hump all my stuffed animals and they all had like one there it is. paw that had no stuffing in it. And that was like that was my paw. We've been at this 26 minutes and we know you used to be a chronic crank collar and hump your stuffed animals. You have a past that we are going to mine over the next few weeks. This is only the tip of the iceberg. Go on. Oh, yeah. Uh, that's nothing. So anyways, I have, I have a stuffed animal and I'm not ashamed to admit it. It's, and it's a little pink dog and, um, I sleep with it. Name and cookie. Uh huh. Um, and what's funny is I'm very good about putting it away. I, I was determined to, keep this from my kids but um of course i was downstairs and i heard them upstairs and i had this image i'm like oh, i didn't put cookie away and i ran up there <laughs> and my daughter kayla had it in her hands and i was like no um and i i removed cookie from the situation but um yeah it's a it's it's been nice i highly recommend and you're perfectly allowed to have things that you don't share with your kids yeah for for me, it's blankets. Like I'll get a really, really soft blanket at Costco, brand new. And Casey will immediately be like, I want to use it. It's mine. And I'm like, no, you can have the, you know, the older one, the hand-me-down model. Like we, like we did with cars in my family growing up. Like I get the brand new one until it's no longer brand new and soft. And then I'll, then I'll pass it down to you. And he doesn't, he gets so worked up 
And I'm like, you're so entitled. Like, it's okay for me to say this is my blanket. Right. Right. It's or or are you? Do you think I'm abusive? You think I'm terrible? Oh well, my God. you are, but I'm for not mother. for other reasons. But okay, no, I agree. For I all think... the show tunes I make him listen to. Yes, I think it's important for kids to see their parents as people with feelings and needs. And and speaking of blankets, that has become such a pain point during this pandemic. Blankets that belong on the couch cannot remain on the couch with kids. Like they just perpetually put them on the floor. And I, at a certain mm-hmm. point, we're the idiots because we keep putting them back on the couch. But I don't understand why blankets on couches yeah. don't stay on couches. It's driving me crazy. It's a Sisyphean task. <laughs> I know big words, too. <gasps> oh, you're so cantankerous. Does that mean pretty? Sure. Thank you. I have been looking forward to a TV show. I saw a promo like back in February on TBS. It is a a brand new original multicam sitcom called Chad, starring Nassim Padrad, written created by Nassim Padrad, who is playing a 14-year-old boy. And for my money, this show is perfection. It is hilarious and actually heartwarming even though it's so over the top. She's so over the top. The rest of the world is, I find, quite realistic. And uh, there have been two episodes. That first episode I watched twice. I laughed so many times and so hard at her character work and the writing. The The jokes in there are solid. And I'm thoroughly enjoying it. Yeah. And I know you watched the first Yeah, one. you told me about it. And I was a little dubious because I don't watch you know, a lot of network TV, even though it's cable, it's TBS. But last night I I watched it and perfection is the same word I would use. And um, (gasps) when it was over, Dave uh, came in just at the tail end and he was laughing and, and he, and I'm like, this is really good. I said, do you want to watch it? And he's like, you just watched it. I'm like, I'll watch it again. And he's like, no, that's ridiculous. And I was like, yeah, that's ridiculous because I felt embarrassed that I would watch it so quickly again. But, but I was ready. To. We didn't watch it again. But um, I loved it. And, you know, I grew up with a lot of Middle Eastern children because I grew up in the Valley and Los Angeles is a very big Middle Eastern population. And he just she just captures so much of that. And I couldn't imagine like one of the kids I grew up with growing up in a place that's where you're you're not surrounded by friends like you. And Mm -hmm. I love the, I love how like strong willed he is at home, but then out in the world, (laughs) he's just so lost and ridiculous. He's insecure about his adolescence and sexuality. He's insecure about his ethnicity. In one of the promos, I don't think we've seen it yet. His mother says like, you seem uncomfortable about being Middle Eastern. And he answers like, I've made that very clear. Yeah. <laughs> like he's so unabashedly anti everything. And it, it, it's her performance, her arms, the way I'm doing an impression, but you can't see it, people. But like the gangly arms and her physicality as Chad is so hysterical and yet real. It's not a caricature. It's not like wacky over the top stuff. It's like, you can imagine, you forget that she's a woman in her 30s. Yeah. It's just such a pitch perfect portrayal. Somebody called it cringe comedy. And then they were saying like, oh, this is a whole, this is where everything is now. Cringe comedy, like Veep and blah, blah, blah. I don't even think of it that way. What's cringy about it? It's just funny. Yeah. I mean, it, it even has some like Wonder Years feeling to it. Like it's it's mm-hmm. earnest and relatable. And um, her performance is like you said, it's just impeccable. The writing is so good and her delivery. Um, I know like we've always been John Mulaney fans and the way he delivers things so seamlessly, Mm -hmm. even though he's done it, you've seen him do the same show twice and he makes it seem like he's never done it before. And yeah, her delivery is just like, yes, (laughs) you know, there's no sense of, of inauthenticity, even though she is like the opposite of this character physically. I know. I, and I watch her in a scene with her little best friend, and he is genuinely a 14-year-old and boy. And that profile and on she, that kid, oh my gosh, it is like, <laughs> I want to draw that. <laughs> He's a very goofy, specific-looking kid. And she is old enough to be his mom, 
But they're in all these scenes together where she's like, shut up and like shoving him. And they're they're very like believable as two 14 year old boys. And I said to Jer, like, what a trip for that kid to like they when they yell cut. He's like, uh, Miss Pedrad, was that good? Like, this is his boss and his potentially a mother figure. But when they're acting together, she's a 14 year old boy. Yeah. And she did a, a sexy scene with a, an actress I had to look up. And the actress herself was like 20. So she's not actually 14. But there's this big sexy scene between the two of them. And it's, I guess that was cringy. It was hilarious. And then the way he describes Watching him cope with sex. sex to the guys, he's like, she had some sex and then I had some sex and then she had some sex and we both had some sex and we just exploded. She, she let me hit her butt. And spit on her face. And then she let me spit on her butt. <laughs> like, that's what he said. Uh, oh, my God. Have you seen the second not episode? Yeah, I can't wait. Okay, spoiler. I'm so sorry. I'm going to quote something. He has to go to the school counselor because he brings a sword to school. And the sword, his dad gave him the sword. And he's very proud of it. It's a real sword. And the school counselor says, well, your dad sounds like a real neat guy. What's your dad like? And the school counselor, the way he's introduced is laugh out loud funny the opening shot with the school counselor is great chad says oh my dad's great he loves olives and he's jacked and friendly like a persian the rock (laughs) and i think that writing is amazing like who describes their parent as he loves olives and he's jacked and friendly like a persian the rock yeah because he's such a little boy but he's becoming a big boy it's perfect yeah Yay, Chad. Okay, so everyone, go watch Chad. And when you love it and you want to tell me how much you love it, please reach out to me on social media at Mandy underscore Kaplan underscore Clavens. And if there's anything you want to tell Megan, she's not on social media, so you can tell me and I promise I'll pass it along to the her next morning on our daily <laughs> chat. Yeah, exactly. Um, So we picked our movie for next week. We did. That we're going to watch. We did did can you tell the people what it is what's the title again searching for sheila searching for sheila sheila was the um rajneesh uh maybe you should describe it in um wild wild country the very uh very popular zeitgeisty documentary from maybe two years ago on netflix it was like a six-parter right she was the main character and one of the people who brought down the the cult and so this is a follow-up documentary about her yeah and she's a very intriguing character and warrants her own documentary i hope with a great voice oh yeah my memory is when she speaks i'm like oh just close my eyes asmr and she's gorgeous i love it yeah so it was between that and a sci-fi thing and i convinced you not to choose the sci-fi thing yeah and i <laughs> and i i'm not a sci-fi fan either but i love tony colette and anna kendrick so much that i was like how could this be bad famous last words but i'm happy to watch right rajneesh more rajneesh and it'll it'll be interesting we haven't talked about wild wild country in a long time so it'll be interesting what we thought and remembered of that but no don't don't say it now save it topic save it as i like to say that's it thank you for having me stand in this is so such an honor your mandemic cherry is popped how do you feel i feel violated but in the best way that's so sweet all right well until we do this again Mm, i love love you. you bye all right bye everyone 